I'm Grace Cavalieri. I'm going to walk through the gallery of Dan Morano and looking at some of his collection of all the many, many years he's been collecting photographs. He has about 80,000 in his computer and he's chosen just a few tonight. I'm Grace Cavalieri. I'm going to tell you who Dan is. He, was, he grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He moved to Provincetown, Massachusetts in 1980, where he lived for three and a half years before leaving the Cape to settle in Arlington, Virginia. Dan spent another three and a half years printing historical photographs at the Library of Congress. In 1987, he accepted a position as a darkroom technician for the Washington Post, and he went on to become photo editor for the Post's digital operation in 1997. Dan retired in 2016. He has continued with his photography. He has two books out. We call him the poet's photographer because he's very beloved in the poetry community. So Danny, what are you going to show us? Well, hello everybody. And thank you for coming out to see the presentation. I'm going to start with a photo of my father, uh, made by my father, of my first generation family sitting at a table. And the reason I'm starting with a picture of my from my father is that he is the person who first inspired me to want to make photographs and pick up a camera, which I did. I had to sneak them when I was a, a little kid, but I would sneak out with a camera whenever I could and practice taking pictures, even though there was no film in the camera most of the time. <laughs> Show us the picture, Danny. Okay, so this is that, that photo and my family gathered around the table. And this is from before I was born. So that's where I sort of started. And uh, this is me in high school. And one of my first self-portraits, um, I did not, I worked on the uh, high school newspaper, but I worked as a reporter instead of a photographer because I, uh, I wasn't so sure of my skills. This is Pittsburgh. Uh, this is not my neighborhood, but I grew up in m around many neighborhoods like this with steel mills in the distance. And uh, that particular steel mill, that's uh, near Oakland, which is the northern part of the city. And it is no longer there. It is uh, Pittsburgh Technology Center. Look at the hills, yeah. Yeah. Hills and the everywhere. Roofs are awesome. They, they are. And everywhere you go in Pittsburgh, you're going over a bridge or you're going up or down a hill. And if it's snowing, you're hopefully not doing either of those. Um, here's another hill in Pittsburgh. There are three rivers. This is overlooking the Monongahela River over towards the south side on the bottom and the, an area known as Beltsuver on the top. But this is not unique to any one specific piece of uh, Pittsburgh. You can find this uh, kind of a scene uh, just about everywhere. Quality rolls. Hills, tunnels, bridges. And yes, I love this quality roll sign. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture of Pittsburgh looking back from the north end into the city. So I, I finally, when I got a car, I would uh, my favorite thing was to take excursions outside the city to some of the beautiful parks and practice landscape photography, which I love doing. Is that film, Danny? Yes, uh, everything is film. And this is actually black and white film with a slight tone on it, a mm -hmm. tint. Uh, what time of day was that? This was early morning. And uh, Pittsburgh weather is usually gray, cloudy in the winter, especially. And... Uh, there are many opportunities for pictures with fog. Mm. Uh, it was one of my favorites from back then. This Tasty is North freeze. Park. I'm sorry? Tasty Freeze. Yes. This is North Park, which is uh, just some miles north of the city. And then there's a South Park, which are they're both immense. And then there are also parks all throughout the city of Pittsburgh. So I never traveled when I was a kid, but finally... I took a, a, in my second year of college, took an excursion to New York with a bunch of classmates. And uh, all I wanted to do was wander around the city making photographs. And it was, uh, I, I got a real charge out of it. And I love doing street photography and catching people 
uh, in candid, you know, without being noticed, although this lady here noticed me, but uh, I was still practicing. This was my neighbor, and it's just a nice photo from um, 1972, I believe. Um, yes, it's 1972. And I just walked out of my porch one day, the lilacs were blooming, and we were surrounded with lilac bushes, which were eight feet tall, some of them. And she was sitting there with her orange and that, that yellow broom and her yellow blouse and the yellow house. And I just, um, there was some harmony there. I just had to take the picture and her, she was so nice to oblige me. And you wouldn't move the broom? I, no, because uh, I, I like to take things as they are. Um, I don't like to move things around even back then, which I'm not, and I didn't really know a lot about documentary photography then, but I still like to work with what was there without moving things around. That's color, love, is that color film, Danny? Uh, yes, this is color slide film here. And uh, the, the, I just like the, the texture of the straw and the lines in the straw that match the her lines in her yellow hair also. Uh, I did a lot of theater photography later on in the 70s. I worked for a, uh, a Pittsburgh Gay Life magazine, and I would uh, get a lot of assignments, and most of it was in black and white, but I also took the opportunity to start working with color film a lot more. And uh, this uh, is a troupe of actors. This is, his name is Kevin Barcelona, and he was a very talented man, and he made his costumes. He not only made costumes, but he sang. This is him as Mae West, and this is him as Carol Channing. He sang, he danced, he wrote material, and just an incredibly talented guy. This is still Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh, yes. In fact, this is Pittsburgh, and this was taken in a club on the north side. And so was this picture uh, from the same place, although this was not any kind of a, um, these were not show show personalities. They were just people enjoying the club and dancing. And I, uh, we used this photo in one of the retreats where we were working on an ekphrastic poetry book of matching images with poems. And a uh, uh, poet wrote a poem about this, describing the dance between a man and a woman and blah, 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 and the whole, you know, the whole thing with, with the uh, courtship. But this is actually two girls. And I, I was a little taken aback with it thinking, well, can I put that in the book? Because it's not so really matched the image. And it, it actually thinking about it a lot, it led me to believe, you know, you have such an attachment to your own photos, especially if you've looked at them hundreds of times over the years. Um, um, do I want to uh, go ahead and, and, and sort of change the meaning of the photo somehow, but actually what I realized was that the photo is what somebody else brings to it. If it's a universal photo and if it's a good photo, someone else can look at that and have a totally different experience. And I don't dictate the experience. They just, their response and their life experience dictates how they experience the photo. And that was a good lesson. You learned me. something. Yes. <laughs> this is another uh, group, a uh, these two uh, girls were uh, part of the troupe of actors. They are our friends, uh, Joyce to the left and Sheila to the right. I just thought it was a nice touching moment as we were, we were setting up a portrait, but then you can still catch these wonderful, wonderful unintrusive moments while you're doing that. My lighting setups were really primitive. They were either a flash or just this big bare bulb and a reflector like you could find at a hardware store. <laughs> I was still very uh, strapped for cash for money so I um, at that time. So I had to be very measured with how many frames I would expose. So I, I had to learn how to nail an image as quickly as possible without having to waste my film. This is Dan Howard who ran a Sven Gulli like uh, master of ceremonies or MC, if you will, for uh, between science fiction films on Saturday afternoons. And he would do skits dressed up as Scorpio and he'd put a wig on and some weird costume. Nice, nice man, talented man. And this was uh, also a documentary picture from uh, 
the gay magazine I was working for, and this was a picnic in North Park. And Fritz is a real character who's depicted here. And he came out and I loved his outfit. And I said, would you just let me take your picture with your big empty rear picture? <laughs> picture? And he just got into this position and uh, obliged me and uh, made a nice photo of him. His, it shows his character. I went downtown Pittsburgh one rainy, wretched day. And, and we, we had a lot of those in Pittsburgh back that spring. Uh, uh, but I like rainy days because they bring out moods in not just myself, but in people that you see on the street. And they're so busy navigating puddles and, and just finding their way and they get lost in their own memories as, as one tends to do on a moody day. And so I was able to move around a lot and capture that without being noticed. This is Wood Street, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Forbes and Wood Street in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, some of these things in the background are not there anymore. The street, it still looks the same, but there are many different things there now. And these, I got managed to make some close ups of some of the people in total reverie. <laughs> And I, I just love that feeling when you capture something that shows a person's um, internal feeling. And this is um, Wood Street again in Pittsburgh and Grace Cavalieri wrote a, a beautiful poem about the nun and what the nun was thinking on her way through this uh, walking up the sidewalk. Look at those feet, Dan. All the, yeah, all the- and, These and, are midair. And her feet especially, they seem a little way down. And you caught that in your poem so beautifully. That will be in one of the uh, next acrostic poetry books. And another one. And uh, I just like, I love seeing the little kids. They're all having their ice cream. And uh, Ray Wells this was sort of an institution back then. It was a, like a sliced off trailer that was only uh, uh, maybe 30 feet long, barely enough for stools for people to sit in and have a hamburger. And they had the best root beer in town. This has and got to be in a museum. These have got to be in a museum. <laughs> I love the uh, shoes on this gentleman in the sport coat coming out. <laughs> yes, yes, I love those Oxfords. Those are, you don't see those anymore, they're so cool. <laughs> And I also was interested in, in everyone's shoes and their pant legs and whatnot as they're crossing these huge puddles in Pittsburgh's uh, kind of rundown streets. Love the bell bottoms, especially. And then up uh, on Smithfield Street, there was this um, lady walking with her son in his uh, pirate out, Pittsburgh Pirates outfit. And uh, he just went up to fix his, his hat and I grabbed this photo, which is just kind of like a little touching moment. This lady, fortunately, I, I was photographing her because her dress was just fascinating, especially with all the contrast with the dreary rainy day. And I just, uh, I, I liked the shapes in it and everything and how it flowed. And then she turned her head back like that with this, so a little bit of an anxiety look on her face. And I thought that it just says something to me. And fortunately I was able to grab the photo. Is There's this black only one... and white film, black and white film? Yeah, this is all black and white film. And I used to press this all my own. So um, I had made prints of this in a dark room, but never until recently did I spend the time to sit. And this is from 1976. So I've only recently had the time to sit and and digitize these and make nice prints out of them. So I'm getting to see a lot of these things for the first time since I retired now. Um, this is a, a, there was a pole with mirrors on it. And I, I took a few pictures into the mirror, the lady walking into the mirror and disappearing with just enough of her that you can um, see something about her, but she's in her, encased in her rain bubble with that big umbrella and just like walking into a dream and the guy is looking into the same mirror. I don't know that he was looking at her, but he was, he just had that same sense of uh, something coming together on a day like that. 
I, I love this lady's uh, bell bottoms and the boots <laughs> and her intense expression. I like that shirt. And yeah, I wish I had that shirt actually. <laughs> it's kind of, I'm sure it's polyester, but it's nice. That was the polyester age. I left Pittsburgh and moved to Provincetown and um, I had never been there before. I just picked up and moved there and had no idea if I was going to make it or not, but I wanted to commit myself to doing photography all the time. And so I moved to Provincetown and um, that's Provincetown. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but basically that's where it looks everywhere. That's the way it looks. And, and it was so nice to move from an industrial city to a small New England town. I used to go to Maine all the time in the summer and uh, I just love New England. So I, I thought, well, Provincetown couldn't be that much different. And it, it is, but it's, uh, it's much bigger than some of the towns I had visited in Maine. This is only the east end of the town. And this is looking down from the Pilgrim Monument. The, um, the Pilgrims first landed in Provincetown and uh, that's the Pilgrim Monument there. And uh, even though all the, uh, the Plymouth Rock is in, you know, Plymouth, Massachusetts, and they claim that as, you know, the landing place of the Pilgrims, but it's not the first landing place. It's they first landed here and then went on to the mainland. You have to walk up the stairs to get to the top of this, but it is well worth it. And here's the view you see from the Provincetown Monument is this surrounds Provincetown and much of the Lower Cape looks just like this. And it is, uh, it's a, such a refreshing place. Lots of woods, lots of sand dunes and miles and miles of sea from wherever you stand, any, any high point you stand, you can see the ocean. Where's the, what is that animal? I have never figured out what animal makes a one pocket track like that. And I don't know if anyone knows, I'd love to hear. <laughs> and this is a tidal pool with the sun. I mean, with the uh, tide, when it, tide rolls in and fills all these pockets in the moors. And uh, they're very nice and warm. You can swim in them because it's much warmer than the ocean waters which could get down to 65, 68 degrees, probably. Danny, talk about the light in that picture. Is that film or what? Yeah, this is still film. This is slide film. And uh, the, the light is coming from the back there. But I love to use slide film because it gives you brighter colors and sharpness. Um, and it's expensive. So you had to be, very, again, very econo economical with it. So I had to kind of learn to nail things with one frame or two frames. If I look, when I look through my negatives, sometimes I only have one frame. I miss something, I miss it. So I, I learned to get a little uh, better reflexes by, by practicing that uh, frugal attempt. And this is another uh, title pool, not the same one, coming in, coming in, as seen from a very tall din atop the uh, atop Provincetown. This is from the highest point actually in the dunes. What is yeah. that light? How did you get that light? Well, the sun was setting back there. So it was just streaming into my camera and flaring across the lens. It's a very peaceful feeling, feeling to sit there and watch the whole process. And that's looking out to the outer part of the, uh, the Cape. There's Provincetown, and then there's a piece that goes around to the outer part there. And there's a breakwater that connects the two, um, as well as you can go all the way around and uh, circle back towards, towards here, but it's a very long walk. Once again, the light, the light. Yeah, light always makes the picture special. What time of day was that, I wonder? That was an evening shot also. Uh, this is back in town and these are the, uh, this is one of the boat yards and the, uh, they would put the boats on trolleys and take them up the rails and work on the underside, painting and patching them uh, for days or weeks at a time. 
and then they'd wheel them back down at high tide, get them back into the water. Very, very nice. And that's the looking east. And I managed to make some pictures of the fishermen on the uh, trawlers while they were at the pier. Those colors. Yeah, the colors on the cape are very nice. They're uh, bright because the light is coming from everywhere. It just It's almost surrounded by ocean because of the way it bends around. Um, and it's 90 miles out from Boston. So you have a lot of water. Like on, on the dune picture back there, if you stand at the top of the dune and you just meditate a little and you look out, you can actually see a slight curve to the earth, which was, uh, that was a nice experience. That was a great experience. <laughs> One more fisherman. And then there is a fleet of dolphin boats um, and so a few other companies run a fleet of boats for taking people out on whale watch cruises. So if you ever go to Cape Cod, a whale watch is a great experience because they usually have a naturalist on board who knows where to find the whales and he knows a lot about them and can explain some of their habits and uh, why they go to the various places they find them. And you'll almost always see at least one whale. I think the last time I went, I saw two or three of them hop out of the water. Is this color film? Uh, this is all slide film. Slide film. Yes. Slides. Right. I used to, um, I used to put slideshows together in a projector, but I don't even have a projector now. Um, I walked by here just in time to see these people looking into this guy's uh, fish bucket. <laughs> and I just, I just love the expression. And uh, so I grabbed my camera, got the shot and they moved. <laughs> Sometimes you only get one chance, you really have to be ready to grab something. And this is just a picture of sea rack stuck to um, uh, or stones and clams stuck to a rope maybe tangled with sand and gems or whatever they are. I just found it very colorful and nice. Mm. This is the breakwater that separates Province Sound from the lighthouse, the arm with the lighthouse on it. And it's not as easy to navigate as the young girl makes it look. It's There's a lot of places where you could trip and fall and go down, get your legs stuck down in a hole there. But what a wonderful it. moment for that little girl, isn't it? She's yeah. there just 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 leaping from rock to rock. It's um, kids love it. Kids love to, to wander around there. And one thing, it's usually covered with with seagull uh, poop. <laughs> uh, this is the newer one of the newer cemeteries. There's an old, very old cemetery, and then there's a new, this newer cemetery. The colors are just a little punchier here because I made the image dark, but generally they are the correct colors. Um, because on the Cape in the fall, you don't have the same colors you have in Vermont or on the mainland. Everything on the fall is more mute. And this, the uh, fall season is much longer on the fall and comes later. But actually, it doesn't come later. The cold starts early, but the colors develop slowly. And uh, the spring, unfortunately, comes much later, too. <laughs> so it's a long gray winter sometimes in Provincetown. This is another view of the same cemetery. I don't know what the green line is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hmm. Nice. I don't know what those green lines are. Um, this was after a uh, blizzard. Danny, why does it look like a painting? Um, this film, uh, this is color negative film, uh, which was Kodakap Color 400, and it was very grainy. It was still fairly a new film back then um, in 1982, 81, 80. Um, it was a relatively new film, so it, you just usually got very grainy exposures. 
Um, and it's also, an, it's been sitting around a long time before I digitized it. And so it's got some fade and stuff. So it took a lot of work to pull the image back out of it. Some of these can take hours to really scan and, and clean up and make them look like they should. The Pilgrim House back here is um, uh, a place where they, uh, hotels on the top or hotel rooms and down on the bottom, they would have this venue for shows and they'd always have entertainment going on in a bar. And it burned down some years ago, Pac uh, probably in the 80s, late 80s, and it's been rebuilt, but I don't believe it looks anything like that. The big building uh, was at the time the Chrysler Museum. I think it was owned by the Chrysler family and it had a giant ship inside the Andrea Dori, but now it is the library. This was right outside my house. Um, I lived um, like down a, a small alleyway just to the left there. And I just came out right after the snow and the colors were wonderful. And this person was walking and I managed to get uh, the picture with the person in it just before um, he got too far away. This, pink this snow, is, pink snow. Yeah. Uh, I love the, the neon on the snow. And this, this little place here is a summer cottage. So somebody would live there from a summer cottage in Provincetown meant usually from May at the earliest until the end of August. And then it got cold unless you had some heat in there. This is this is the main street, by the way. Uh, and so were so were the other pictures. And this was the little store, which is like a 7-Eleven packed to a little packed into this little place that was open all year round. And very few places were because a lot of uh, a lot of businesses would board up for the winter after the tourists left. This is the main street again, and uh, I set up my tripod while it was snowing. And Jean Kent, a sculptress, was walking up the street, and I managed to grab a frame of her in just about where I wanted her before she kept on moving right past the camera. That's the main street. Yes, that's the main street. Not very big. The uh, province has two main streets, uh, Commercial Street and Bradford, they run parallel. And between them, there are probably 80, 70, I don't know how many side streets with other cross streets. And that's the whole town. And there's a very large Portuguese prop population there. And I just liked the sign because uh, it just spoke to the regular inhabitants of Provincetown as opposed to people who moved there for a few years like myself and and aren't haven't grown up there the whole time. Is that a restaurant? It's uh, more of a bar, but yes, it's a restaurant also. No pets. <laughs> and this is typical of the side streets in Provincetown between the two long streets. All the houses are wonderful, New England, old style. Um, these were some Provincetown residents, Joe Patrick, and uh, this man on the right, everyone knows him as Popeye. Even now, people who have ever lived there know him and recognize him as a very nice man. And I liked, I pair the pictures because of their coats being so similar in, in being well-worn and comfortable for them. And uh, in Provincetown, we didn't have clothing shops, dress shops, all that kind of stuff. So you you pretty much stuck with what you had and were happy with it. This is summer in Provincetown on the beach and clowning around. And I, I just loved the teeth on this girl, the big giant smile in the glasses and just thought it was a very funny picture. And don't know what the hand coming in the picture was. I was a friend of hers obviously, but um, uh, it just makes me think about it when I look at the picture and makes me smile. And this is a typical tourist site that you'll see. Um, this is closer to the uh, town pier where all the places that sell the uh, less fine, fine cuisine. <laughs> 
this is Ruth who ran the local health associates thrift shop. And she was a wonderful, warm, funny lady. And she had a chair there where people would come and sit and chat with her for hours. And uh, if you needed something, if you needed a coat, if you needed a shirt, pants, bric-a-brac dishes, you went to Ruth's and you could usually find it and she'd sell you something for a quarter or 50 cents. And you know, she never tried to, uh, she never charged you too much for anything. Did those shoes match? Do you think they ever had two of a pair? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Unless maybe that one from the person who was walking in the dunes back there left their shoes. <laughs> This was a kitchen in my first cottage there, and uh, it was a very tiny little place, no heat at all. And it gets cold there even in the summer, oh. on summer nights. But um, I had my dark room in the kitchen, so the front window there has a plastic bag over it, a uh, black plastic bag. But there wasn't much light anyway. This streak of light is all that ever came in every day right around the, uh, right before sunset, I would get this burst of light and then it was gone. You lived in an unheated place? Right, for the summer. Oh. Until, um, until the middle of September, it was pretty cold by then. <laughs> that was my diet of Triscuits and uh, Tab. Uh, this was the second place I got after that. And the, uh, this is an old Cape, Hod, Cape Cod house that I was told was floated back when the houses used to be on Long Point where that lighthouse was. Um, they were floated across the bay and people moved them in, inside for more protection. So they moved a bunch of houses. And this was back in the 1800s. What is that pulley doing? Um, that's my trap door. That's how I got in and out of the apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it because you'd go in there, close the trap door, nobody would bother you. If it was a sunny day, light would stream in those windows all day. Somebody, I don't know if they added it for design or had some weird accident, but they spilled bleach along the bright orange carpet. So it had this yellow streak going through it. Did you do a lot of writing on that typewriter? I did. And uh, I watched a bit of TV. You see the picture was pretty tiny, but uh, the only TV signal was an uh, antenna from Boston that you'd get from Boston, signals from Boston. And that was me. I, I started doing a lot of self-portraits there and because uh, I needed a model to practice on. So I was the available model. And uh, this is all my print boxes behind me there and photo books. So that was my life at the time. I call that your Kandinsky. That's a <laughs> fine art. Thank you. Then I moved to Washington, D.C., which was kind of a more happening place and fun. And I had never been to Washington, D.C. either and just moved here, got a job and uh, took it from there. And this was uh, Fourth of July in the National Mall when you could still have alcohol and no, no big security fences and the Beach Boys still played. Every summer, the Beach or every Fourth of July, the Beach Boys would come until uh, in the 80s, they ended that. I love photographing people, uh, even when they notice me, uh, they make great photos. Some friends of mine came to town and I took them around and it started to snow and we went to see the, I wanted to show them the Vietnamese War Memorial and it just seemed uh, serendipity. That was the perfect time to be there. And I saw this picture that just seemed to mean something to me and uh, just the coldness and the black wall and the tourists braving it. I was in a restaurant and uh, my friends were waiting for me outside and I saw them looking through this uh, grimy window and <laughs> went up and took their photo. Is that film? This is film, yes, black and white film. I love photographing people and I love using black and white still. A lot of people don't like it, but I love black and white because it, um, color is wonderful, obviously, but um, it's more of a surface thing and it's, you don't get into 
the interior of the subject matter as easily sometimes as you can with black and white because with black and white you get drawn into the image and you have to use your imagination a little bit more hmm. whereas color just presents itself to you uh, not that there isn't depth to it but but there is i started photographing a lot of gay pride uh parades just for the color uh and wonderful uh celebratory spirits and uh, this is this lady was called disco granny and she always dressed outrageously this is 1985 and then this is her again in 1991 um, just happened to go by and this was Barbara Bush was still president when this was made. <laughs> so I guess I'm guessing she's dressed as Barbara Bush. This is a more recent one. This is a digital image mm. uh, um, that I started using my digital camera a little more recently. It's a little easier for some things than because uh, film can be very tedious if you have to spot an image and and uh, take out dust spots and scratches and whatnot. But with digital, you don't have all that. This is film again. This is color slide. It's just nice, especially when times are tough to see a lot of happy people. Um, this lady, um, she was a, uh, I guess she was more than the waitress. She might have been the uh, maitre d' at, at a little restaurant called Trio's on 17th Street. And people would always say, oh, it was Wayland Flowers. I don't know if anyone knows who Wayland Flowers is, but they would say, oh, he modeled his, uh, his puppet madam after, after her. And that is a rumor. You can look that up on the internet. But uh, so I had a picture of Wayland Flowers also from when I was back in Provincetown and, and that's him there. That's his puppet, madam. She was uh, actually the, the one that he modeled it after, if he did, uh, was, a, was a wonderful sweet lady with a good sense of humor, I might add. More gay pride. This is Kodachrome film, which gives you these brighter reds and like the Paul Simon song says, the greens, reds, all these wonderful uh, colors. And it's not made anymore, unfortunately. This is Kodachrome also. This is at the Pride Festival. And then I go into some other photos that I've taken along the, um, mostly the later years. This is my mom and my nephew leaving the flea market with the usual dismissal I would get when trying to take a photo of my mom. Uh, this is Patrick looking very intense. It was a very tough time in his life. And it's all, you can see it all in his face and even in his clothing. Mm. I, um, I love animals and I took a, few opportunities to go to an animal sanctuary. And uh, um, I just thought this horse had this very, very expressive and mm. sad face. And he was looking at me and I just, and I just loved the way everyone was reaching at him. And he was so gentle. Mm. I had to make his photo. You have a great way of catching expressions on people's faces and hear an animal. Yes, I love capturing expressions on animals faces especially because they they do have very exp uh, expressive faces if you pay attention and this was a train locomotive that was parked in uh, randomly in Crystal City in Arlington where there was just a little section of railroad tracks that led nowhere and I don't know why it was there but it seemed abandoned and it was open so I climbed into it and took a few photos because uh, I'd never been inside a locomotive before. So that's the front of the locomotive on a nice snowy day. Down, this is downtown at McPherson Square. And uh, I, I, like I said, love to do street photography. I love to capture people, but also uh, the presence of people, which this does capture. But this bike. is fine art as well as documentary. It yes, and it, it leaves you 
with a sense of time and something happening past or present. And I just love that. And we did an ekphrastic book of poetry on trees with Grace and a bunch of poets. Um, uh, and uh, this was one of the photos that was in it. I love trees, photographing trees. And uh, when I started working at the post in the darkroom, one of the photographers would always say to me, if you want to be a photographer, or photograph a tree, just make a good picture of a tree. And it's very hard to do. And I thought, oh, I can probably give that a try. And so I, I, I and I probably had been photographing trees. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's not, you know, that's something I'm going to do. And so I started making more pictures of trees. Mm. And I love them for their stateliness and for mm. what, for their sense of longevity and, and strength. This is uh, Skyline Drive. The light. Once again, the light. The light. It's all in the light. And this was Cape Cod, but I put it back here with the trees. And uh, the white area back there is not snow. That's sand. This is white sand from the Cape. This is actually outside of Provincetown. And this is Vermont. Mm. On the first day of October, 1987, I, I got there September 30th and I woke up the next morning and it snowed, which was really early. And I went outside and made these soft photos. It was so quiet, um, which is another thing about um, being out in the country. This is far, far north, near near the border of Canada. And this is um, in uh, Akatik, Virginia. And these trees were deforested by beetles. And uh, they, the sun was fortunately setting at just the right time when I was going by there. And so I made this photo. And I, just, I love the way the uh, sun turned into a pair of eyes. Mm. What kind of film is that? That was just a uh, regular um, color slide film again. This is, um, whoops, I'm sorry, I got one ahead of me. This is Red Rock Canyon in Las Vegas. If you ever go to Las Vegas, Red Rock Canyon is beautiful. It's only, uh, I think it's eight or nine miles, if that, outside the city. And it's this long excursion through the mountains on a good road. But it's surrounded by these red cliffs. And uh, I was just amazed to see this young girl climbing the mountain with no shoes on. And there are wild burrows just wandering all around there uh, through many acres. But you see the mountain behind him, which is basically how it is surrounded with us. And this is in Chincoteague, Virginia, which is sister uh, sister area to Act Peak. And sometimes you just have to pay attention to little details in a photo to uh, capture something you might otherwise miss. <laughs> Only the photographer would see that. <laughs> And this is the last one. This is um, I, from a trip to Paris. I, I initially was going to show the Christmas card I made from it where I manipulated the image and made something out of it. Um, I don't normally like to manipulate images. I like to present them as they are to the best that I can make them look. But uh, I'll make some ex exceptions. But when I do, I like to point it out that I've made some exceptions. Uh, but this is this is just the uh, straight photograph of that scene. And this was Christmas Day. And that's it. Dan, so we saw a small amount of your 80,000 photos. And we <laughs> are, I am very, very mindful of one thing. And that is that observation is a spiritual practice. That you're knowing what to see and your awareness of being in the moment sometimes in the split moment is a very touching thing to me. So do you want to talk about that in terms of a spiritual practice? 
yes, awareness is everything when you're photographing, um, whether it's in the studio, whether it's on the street. It's especially on the street because I don't like to just hunt for things. A lot of people are hunting for photos and whatnot, but I like to just be aware. And when I see something, and you have to be predictive too, because if you're not, if you see it and then go for your camera, which is usually behind my hip, sort of hidden so people don't know I'm out photographing, trying to photograph them. Um, um, if you see it, you may have missed it by the time your camera gets up to your eye, but if you learn to anticipate behaviors, then you're ready. And as soon as you see it start to happen, you have your camera there. And it's usually so fast that they don't notice it if you're good. I mean, or if you're lucky, I should say, not good. And if you're fortunate enough to be in the right place in the right time, but I have a seem to have an element of serendipity a lot where things just unfold wherever I walk around and just there's something happening everywhere if you just look around. And it's, yeah. it's very enriching to see. Do you, do you find that you get into a heightened state when you uh, once you pick up your camera and you know that you're about to go into a street photography scenario or one of these photography scenarios? And then when it's passed, it's sort of like you come down from that state. Is that your experience? Um, a little bit, but more than likely, I work it as long as I have that inspiration. And so when I come out of it, I'm just tired. <laughs> uh-huh. It's like the way a poet looking at a blank piece of paper will get you get into a different kind of state. And then when you put it away, you come back to another state. Yeah. And and sometimes you're just mentally exhausted or something, or you're <laughs> just like, all right, I'm gonna put this away now. I see it. And then you'll see something else and it'll start again. But the photographer notices things like the poet. Like the and, poet. Yes. And so we want to thank you so much. And we're going to look forward to the next show because we have 70,000 and 90 left, I think. <laughs> and I would like everyone to know that your website is danmorano.com. It's very thank easy you. to find. There's also poetry there because he is the poet's photographer. This is the poet and the poem. Thank you, our producer, Henry Crawford. And all of Danny's friends are here and some poets are here. And it's been such a pleasure to be with you, Dan. Thank you we very love much, you Grace. So much. Thank we love you, you, Henry. And thanks, everyone, for listening and tuning in. And I hope it was worth it. Thank you. Bye. Good night. <laughs>